on this edition of It's a Miracle. In the battle for the Philippines during the Second World War, two army buddies are captured and sent to separate POW camps. For the next four years, they would endure brutal and inhumane conditions. But a single brief reunion would change both of their lives forever. Look, Skinner, I want to give you something. And an ordinary ring would play a part in an incredible miracle. Take care of yourself, OK? During a routine examination, a young woman asks her doctor to order a mammogram. I just had this feeling that, <laughs> that I should have it done. OK. And he said, well, well uh, when patients tell me that they have a feeling about something, that I've learned, he says, to always listen. Let's go ahead and order that for you. Thank you. Next thing I know, I've got a telephone call from him saying, oh my goodness, you have two malignancies in your left breast. But her battle with cancer took her down a road she never expected to travel. Okay, you know I love you. I love you too. When a young man loses control of his car and plunges into a deep ravine, he's left seriously injured and trapped where no one could possibly see him. I thought I was gonna die out there. I had a lot of difficulty breathing. It was a real nasty situation. Now his only hope for survival is his pet dog. Dusty! And I yelled for him, and he wouldn't come down to the car. That's because Dusty had a plan of his own. Dusty! These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle, a miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight, we take a fresh look at a familiar topic, the power of the human spirit to overcome incredible adversity. But in each of the true stories you're about to see, the people involved received a little extra help from the most unlikely sources. We begin with a story of friendship and sacrifice that takes us back to a time and place where miracles were needed more than ever, World War II and the battle for the Philippine Islands. It was 1939 and World War II was just beginning when recent Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania high school graduate Arthur Bressy and his best friend, Billy Skinner Ayers, decided to enlist. Arthur's daughter, Barbara, remembers. They decided to join the United States Army. And they went through basic training together. They did everything together. And after they were out of basic training, they had their choice of orders where they could go, and they decided to go the furthest place away from the coal mines they could go. So they chose the Philippines. By April 1942, under relentless attack by Japanese forces, the Philippine Islands surrendered one by one. Arthur and Skinner were both captured and imprisoned. The two men would face nearly four brutal years in separate POW camps. Arthur would survive, but almost never spoke about what had happened until nearly 20 years later, on a night his daughter will never forget. On my 16th birthday, after dinner, we got up and Mom and I cleaned up the kitchen. And uh, should I give it to her now? Father went into his office and he came out and he said, I have a gift for you. Barbara, honey, sit down. What is it? I, I, just, I just want you to read it. And he handed me a manuscript. I mean, I could tell he had typed it a long time before he gave it to me. And I sat there and I read it. The Ring by Arthur A. Bressy. By all the rules, Skinner was a dead man. He was on Bataan when it fell to the Japanese in April 1942. Corregidor, where I was stationed, fell a month later. At the surrender, I grew preoccupied with my class ring. The Japanese were taking everything of value from captured Americans. They were efficient. If a soldier couldn't get his ring off, they chopped off his finger with a sword. Go! 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 
My father wore a navy neckerchief around his neck. He took his class ring off and he hid it in the knot of the neckerchief, hoping that the Japanese would not find it. Put it! And they didn't. Even while under constant guard, it was still possible to receive information about other POW soldiers. I got some news on your friend Skinner. Through the prisoner of war grapevine, I learned that Skinner was at Camp 1, only six miles from where I was held in Camp 3. How bad is he? Zero ward. Zero ward was the last stop for prisoners so ill that death was inevitable. I lost hope of ever seeing him again. Healthy prisoners were pressed into work details on a quota basis. I volunteered for one, not knowing where it would go, but hoping it would pass through Camp 1. It did. Dad was suffering from every disease you can think of, malnutrition, vitamin C deficiency, but he volunteered for the detail because he wanted to find his best friend. When the work gang arrived at Camp 1, Arthur took another chance. Could I visit the sick side? I asked the Japanese guards. They gave me a white flag mounted on a bamboo pole and a pass. Walk slowly, they said. Carry the flag high or be shot. Carry the pass high in the other hand or be clubbed. When he reached the fence outside Zero Skinner. Ward, Arthur called for his friend. Hey, Skinner! Skinner! I listened while the other prisoners relayed his name. Out of the barracks, tottering slowly, painfully, came the wreckage of a human body I didn't at first recognize. Hardy? I tried to conceal my horror. This was Skinner? When we last saw each other, Skinner packed a solid 214 pounds. His skin was now drawn tight over a skeleton that weighed 79 pounds. He was in agony from malaria, amoebic dysentery, pellagra, scurvy, and beriberi. He couldn't eat or drink because of the pain in his mouth and throat. Hey, Arnie. Hey, Arnie. Skinner. Hey. It's good. It's good to see you. You doing good? You hanging in there? Yeah, man. Yeah. My hand found its way to the knot on my neckerchief, and my fingers played with the hard lump inside. The ring. Look, Skinner, I want to give you something. No guards were in sight. Quickly, I unslipped the knot and passed the ring through the fence. Maybe you can wheel and deal that for yourself. Artie, keep it, Artie. This and get yourself okay. You gotta take care of yourself, okay? Get some food and get some medicine, okay? Yeah! Let it go. He wrapped bony fingers tightly around the ring and promised someday he would buy me another exactly like it. Time was up. And so, Arthur left his dying friend never expecting to see him again. The dramatic conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. On her 16th birthday, Barbara Bressy received a very personal gift from her father, Arthur. It was the story of what happened when he and his best friend, Billy Skinner Ayers, enlisted in the Army at the beginning of World War II. Both men chose to fight in the Philippines, and both were eventually captured and sent to separate POW camps. Months later, when Arthur finally found his friend, Skinner was racked with disease, malnourished, and barely alive. There was only one hope, a miracle. Arthur passed him the only thing he had of value, a class ring, and the two men said goodbye. It would be the last time they'd see each other for the rest of the war. The days and weeks that followed for Skinner contained an incredible sequence of near miracles. I learned of them only after the war. Among the Japanese guards at the Zero Ward was a middle-aged fellow who displayed a prominent gold tooth at the rare intervals he smiled. The guard took pity on his dying prisoner and, ignoring the orders of his superiors, made a friendly gesture. 
He'd taken a cigarette, broken it in half, and dropped one of the halves with a match alongside the fence. The next day, Skinner took the biggest hey. risk of his life. Hey. Weighing all the odds of being caught with a valuable item against getting in return nothing at all, or at most a few more pieces of candy, he decided to trust the Japanese guard. He offered him the ring. He said he wanted to trade it for anything to help him. Nanika, Nanika. Ichiban? Is it valuable? Yes, yes. All of great value, Skinner replied. Nanika, please. Where did you get it? Where did you get it? demanded the guard. From a friend. Please. Quickly, the guard slipped the ring into a pocket and left. One day soon after, the guard beckoned again, dropped something, then strode off on patrol. Skinner picked up the small packet. He opened it carefully, and his blood raced. Inside were sulfanilamide tablets. The guard visited again and again. Each time, he brought something. One day, it was a small basket of limes to combat scurvy and pellagra. Another time, it was a pair of pants and a jacket. Again, bananas. If the guard had been caught helping a prisoner, it could have cost him his life. But a bond had formed between these two men. They were no longer enemies. They were friends. And it was this small light of human kindness in the dark inhumanity of war that gave Skinner back his life. Arigato. Arigato. Thank you. In 1945, our United States government finally won the war against Japan. And our prisoners of war, after almost four years in captivity, were released. For Arthur and the other POWs, the nightmare was finally over. 69 months after I had enlisted, I was back in Mount Carmel. I'd been home only a few hours when the doorbell rang. Skinner, buddy, oh, how are you doing? How you doing, are you? Good. How you doing? Oh man, it's good to see you. We're home, but we're yeah. home. That ring you gave me, it saved my life. He said, as much as I know, I'm the only man that ever made it out of Zero Ward alive. And he said, I wanted to thank you for the sacrifice you made. And he handed my father a duplicate of the class ring. Let's go. Hey, hey, don't lose this one. It cost me $17.50, OK? <laughs> Lose it? Never. It's in a special jewelry box, locked and hidden. I finished reading the story, and I knew from that moment on that I'd never be able to look at my father the same way again. I couldn't stop crying, and my father was crying, and I held him, and I told him I loved him. And it was at that moment that he gave me the ring. Thank you so much. He told me that the ring was the only legacy of his life and the way he had led his life that he could give to me. And that what the ring stood for was a bond that was stronger than any blood relationship that anyone could ever have. And he told me that the ring was mine that the legacy that went with the ring was the legacy I was supposed to pass on to my children when I had my children. Arthur's courage, perseverance, and dedication to his friend saved Skinner's life. But it wouldn't have been possible without the incredible humanity of the mysterious Japanese guard who risked his life to help a stranger. Dad was incredible. He gave to everyone. He loved everyone. And he lived. He lived life. What an incredible story. Sadly, Billy Skinner Ayers passed away in 1980 and Arthur Bressey in 1989. But their legacy lives on and on. Joining us now are two people who wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for the ring. Billy Ayers' children, Bill Jr. and Mary. Welcome to the show. Uh, hello, Richard. Hi, Richard. You must be very proud of your father. I feel that he's very special. He had a lot of character, 
and hopefully he passed on a lot of that the characteristics to, to both of us. Uh, at least we tried to emulate him in, in, in a lot of different ways. And of course, none of it would have been possible without Arthur Bressy. If Artie hadn't have found where he was at and gotten out on a work party to, to see him and then smuggle him the ring, um, there, there's no doubt in my mind, I think that my, my father would have died long ago. What amazes me is with the thousands of soldiers that were there, how Artie found him. That was amazing to me. That's a miracle right there. That's a miracle how he could find my father with all the soldiers. It really is amazing, and I wish you were here to tell us more about it. I'm sure you do, too. Well, I miss him. I miss my dad very much. And I wish he was here to see his grandchildren. I know he'd be very proud of them. As I'm sure they must be of him. Thank you both for joining us tonight and sharing your story with us. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. Coming up. While recovering from a second operation from breast cancer, a mother is told that her 10-year-old daughter has cancer as well. I just remember looking at David. He just slumped over and started crying. Now both mother and child are battling the same deadly disease and praying for a miracle. An icy country road, a hairpin turn, and a plunge into a deep ravine leaves a young man fighting for his life. I wasn't wearing a seat belt and I woke up in the back seat on the passenger side. I was in real bad shape. I couldn't do anything because I had hurt my neck. His only hope now is his pet dog, Dusty. But what can a 10-pound dog do in the middle of the wilderness? Dusty! Find out when It's a Miracle continues. What would you call it when an ordinary house pet becomes involved in a life and death drama and then scopes out the situation, weighs the odds, and comes to the rescue in a very logical and unexpected way? Well, the man you're about to meet calls it a miracle. In the fall of 1996, Joel Ward was a marketing and management student at a northern Minnesota university. A few years earlier, he and his girlfriend had purchased a small dog, a Bichon Frise they thought looked like a dust mop. So they named him Dusty. He was my buddy. He went everywhere with me. He's a lap dog, and he snuggles, and he's a really good companion. One night in October, Joel made one of the luckiest decisions of his life he decided to take Dusty on a road trip up north. My dad had had a heart attack, and he was closing up the cabin, and I decided that I was going to go up and help him out because I had the next day off of school. Be safe. When we drive someplace, Dusty always sat in the back window. And he's this real small dog, so he sits back there, and he gets a good view of everything. Joel's trip would take him into one of the least populated areas of the country, a wooded wilderness near the Canadian border. The Tomahawk Trail is very deserted. Uh, there's no houses back there. There's no people. Uh, it's very seldom driven at night. But the back road would shave several hours off his driving time. So Joel took it. It must have been about 10.30 at night. It was raining. It was uh, very cold out. It might have even been getting that time of the year with a little bit of slush on the, on the roads. I was driving too fast. When I came around a corner, I took the corner too wide, and I tried to counter steer, but it just kept sliding on the gravel. Joel's car skidded off the road and rolled down an embankment into a rocky gully. The force of the impact knocked him unconscious. I wasn't wearing a seat belt, and I woke up in the back seat on the passenger side. I was in real bad shape. I couldn't do anything because I had hurt my neck. Dusty! Dusty had been thrown from the vehicle unharmed. Dusty! It was pretty cold out, and I, you know, I was starting to get a bad chill, and I had no jacket on, just a T-shirt. The temperature was hovering around freezing. Joel would never be able to survive the night. He could barely move, and even if someone drove by, Joel's car could not be seen from the road. There was only one hope, Dusty. 
but what could a 10-pound dog do in the middle of the wilderness? Christy! I could see him out the front window, and I yelled for him. Come on. And he wouldn't come down to the car. Christy! Christy! I thought I was going to die out there. Come on. I had a lot of difficulty breathing. Chills were setting in from hyperthermia. It was a real nasty situation. Dusty! Joel continued to call for Dusty, but the dog refused to obey. Instead, he positioned himself on the side of the road, waiting for someone, anyone, to drive down the remote Tomahawk Trail. We go through that road in the daytime and usually not in the nighttime. Why are we coming this way? We never go this way. Mary and Jewel Foster were on their way home from a day trip. Normally, we probably would have went around the other way because it's a road where there's not a lot of traffic. What is that, honey? That's a dog, Mary. What's a dog like that doing out here in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night? I don't know, but something's wrong. It was kind of like dancing, fluttering. He was trying to stop us. I automatically thought there was something wrong because there's not no dog out in the woods. Not there. Because <laughs> you're in the middle of nowhere. Hey, honey, look. There's skin marks. Yeah, yeah. There's somebody's head They're of They're all the way across. They go oh, over there. Yeah, they go well, over the road. The dog went in down here. Let's An go. impatient Dusty led the Fosters down the ravine to his master. Can you get the doors open? Oh. Here he is. He's over here. Uh, the people came down there and asked if I was all right, and I told them no. My neck's hurt. Please help me. Well, I couldn't get the doors open in the car. I'll go get you some help. Okay. I was crowded in rocks and stuff like that, and there was nothing we could do. It was dangerous just trying to walk over there. So we turned around and went back. There's no phone service on that road, so you couldn't call 911 or nothing like that. In a town several miles away, Mary and Jewel found help and led them back to where Joel had gone off the road. What we're going to do is we're going to have to cut you out of the car, OK? Firemen used the jaws of life to pry open the door of the car. Joel had been saved, but Dusty wasn't aware of that yet. And they had pried the door open, and the dog jumped in on my lap. Now, the dog was sitting on my lap guarding me, and when they tried to give me some medical attention, the dog bit him. So he was trying to protect me. Uh, the only way that they could get the dog off me was to put uh, great big fireman gloves on and reach in and grab him. Then the ambulance took me to the hospital, and the dog had to go to jail. Dusty wasn't booked on any charges. She was just held in custody while Joel received medical attention. I had CAT scan done and x-rays, and uh, I was informed that I came very, very close to breaking my neck. Miraculously, Joe escaped serious injury, and the next day, he bailed out his best friend and miniature miracle worker. My name is Joel Ward. I'm here to pick up my dog. He's my hero. I believe that, for one thing, it's a miracle that he didn't get killed in the accident and that I didn't. And another thing is that I kept calling and calling and the dog would not come down, which is very unusual for this dog because he listens very well. Otherwise, I believe that the people would have drove right past. You could not see the car from the road. Why are we coming this way? We never go this way. There probably would have been nobody coming through there for four more hours. We very seldom ourselves, once late at night, come through there because we know if something happens, there ain't going to be nobody to help us. Why we did that night, I don't know. I think it's a miracle that the dog was there to really get our attention. I really do believe the dog was trying to save its master's life. I think he was out there knowing that he needed to do something because he loves me. He's a man's best friend. It's taken some time, but Joel has fully recovered from his injuries. And Dusty received a six-month supply of dog food and a certificate of heroism for his miraculous deeds. We'll be right back. Coming up next, the amazing story of a mother and child, both suffering from deadly cancer, who fight to stay alive for themselves and for each other. The hardest times for me were the times when I was laying on this cot next to her, 
my fears would come rise up then. And I remember my prayers over and over and over again were to please let us live. It's a miracle of love and faith when It's a Miracle returns. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. To face a deadly disease like cancer requires incredible strength and courage. But in our next story, that strength and courage is tested beyond normal human endurance. You see, the woman you're about to meet had to face the threat of cancer three times. Twice in her own life and once in someone else's. And it was the combination and timing of these battles that would help create a miracle. In the fall of 1995, Deborah Cook was on top of the world. She had a successful career as an emergency room nurse in a Falls Church, Virginia hospital. She'd just started a new marriage with a man named David, and her two children, nine-year-old Graham and eight-year-old Edlin, seemed to care for him as much as she did. No, that doesn't go there. The oh, okay. But her comfortable world would soon be shaken by a major health crisis. Ah. Uh. All right. It happened during a routine physical examination. Well, everything seems to be checking out okay. Any special concerns? Well, actually, I've been thinking that, um, that just to be on the safe side, that I should have a mammogram done. I've just had this feeling that, <laughs> that I should have it done. Okay. And he said, well, when patients tell me that they have a feeling about something, that I've learned, he says, to always listen. Let's go ahead and order that for you. Thank you. Next thing I know, I've got a telephone call from him saying, oh my goodness, you have two malignancies in your left breast. I mean, don't worry about anything, okay? David stayed by Deborah's side as she was prepped for a radical mastectomy. Deborah and I had been married about 13, 14 months. I love you too. As traumatic as it was, I always felt that everything was gonna be okay. The five-hour-long operation was a major success, and her chances for a full recovery were excellent. The cancer was found on mammogram at a very early stage. Consequently, I didn't need chemotherapy. I didn't need radiation. I just needed the surgery. And I just considered myself whistling Dixie lucky. But 21 months later, Deborah's luck ran out when she discovered a suspicious lump in her right breast. And I felt it, and I felt it, and I thought, oh, God, it's a lump. So I called my surgeon right away. This is Deborah Cook. I need to make an appointment with Dr. Robert as soon as possible. Both samples came back malignant. And when I got that phone call from him, I, I have to say that I felt worse the second time than I did the first time. Deborah was readmitted to the hospital for a second mastectomy. This time, she would also require chemotherapy. And then, while recuperating at home, her daughter, Edlin, returned from school complaining of not feeling well. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. How was school? Okay, but I, I'm not feeling too good today. She looked terrible. She was very pale, and she was clenching her chest. It might sound weird, but my heart really hurts. Like having a heart attack. Yeah. Why don't you go get me the thermometer? I'll take your temperature. Okay. I got home, and we took Edlin to the emergency room where, coincidentally, Deborah had worked. We've been running some tests on Edlin, and I'm afraid to say this. She has leukemia. I'm very sorry. I just remember looking at David, and he was crushed. He just slumped over and started crying. And he kept saying over and over, it's just not fair. That Friday morning, Edlin went off to school looking like just any normal kid. But within 12 hours, you're being told that this very normal, healthy child has cancer. It was like being hit over the head with a two-by-four. 
I'd like to be able to tell Adlin myself, if that's okay with you. If you think that's best. Edlin's pediatric oncologist, Dr. Mariana Horn, broke the news to her in a very direct manner. Hi, Edlin. Hi. Edlin, I'd like to tell you something. You have a disease called leukemia. It is very important to use the word leukemia and the word cancer right off the bat so that the children do hear what the true diagnosis is. So what we need to do is give you some medicine to fight off the bad guys. And I always try to tailor how I describe the illness or the diagnosis to the age of the child, of course. And you may lose your hair and you'll be out of school for at least a year. A whole year. A whole year. Both mother and daughter were now battling cancer. Um, I can't believe something like this would actually happen to me. Oh, sweetheart, nobody can be prepared for this. I said, you know, God works in very mysterious ways, and I don't know why this has happened to us, honey, but it has, and it's happened to us at the same time. And the good thing about that is we'll be able to help each other. We are going to lose our hair together, grow up together, my matching hat. We will be there for each other. Um, I am sorry, but a part of me is glad that I don't have to go through this alone. Oh, you don't, sweetheart. The emotional conclusion when it's a miracle continues. In the fall of 1995, 41-year-old Deborah Cook was diagnosed with breast cancer, but even after a successful mastectomy and breast reconstruction surgery, the cancer returned to her other breast. Then, while recovering from a second mastectomy, she received the devastating news that her 10-year-old daughter, Evelyn, also had cancer. Now, mother and daughter both face the uncertainty of a deadly disease, but together, they vowed to help each other fight to stay alive. The hardest times for me when Edlin was first diagnosed were the times when I was laying on this cot next to her at three or four o'clock in the morning and it was quiet and dark. My fears would come rise up then. I cried then. I prayed then. And I remember at that point with both her life and my life on the line and not knowing what the future brought, my prayers over and over and over again were to please let us live. The fact that both Deborah and Edlin were going through this at the same time, as horrible as it was, I think gave each of them a measure of comfort. We weren't quite sure who was going to lose their hair first, although Edlin's doctors said that it would probably be Edlin. Well, as it turned out, it was me. So I said to the kids, you know what? We're gonna have a head shaving party. And they looked at no king. So we put a plastic raincoat poncho over myself and sat in the middle of the kitchen. Graham and Edlin each had scissors and buzzers and they went at my head and they were told they could do whatever they wanted. The baldness was really kind of neat, I liked it. And I think it was because I took it into my own hands and I made the decision to do it instead of letting the cancer do it to me. Well then, a few weeks later, Edlin started to come out in clumps. So we got the same buzzers back. She sat in the kitchen and this time it was my turn. There's no doubt that the two of us sitting together with no hair I can look at her and see the beauty in her baldness, and she can look at me, think likewise, and say, we're progressing, we're getting there. Deborah's nursing background allowed her to take care of Edlin primarily at home. Edlin, honey, try to get some of that food down so you can take these pills. This was not the shared experience that I think either one of them ever dreamed of, but the fact that they were going through it together gave them an incredible bond. 
And that bond continued to grow. It meant that love and hope was always there, that when one of them was down, the other could help lift them back up. And slowly, Edlin and her mother began showing signs of improvement. There came a point when the light at the end of the tunnel was not another train. <laughs> and it seemed like it had been that way for an awfully long time. I think it was probably when, when Edlin graduated from the more aggressive treatment into the maintenance therapy. Edlyn is nearing the end of her treatment. She has about 17 weeks of treatment left. She's in that home stretch where the treatment is rather routine. And we have extremely high hopes that uh, this will mean that she will be cured forever. Good morning, how are you? Deborah's visits with her oncologist, Dr. Nicholas Robert, have also become very hopeful. And he marvels at the progress she's made given the incredible circumstances. Well, I think anyone that has to fight their own battle for cancer has to be courageous. I think what makes Deborah very special is that not only did she have to do that for herself, but as a parent, she saw her child diagnosed with a cancer that could be fatal. And she had to find energy and courage to not only fight her own battle, but to help her child fight her battle. Today, Deborah continues to help in the fight against cancer in a very personal way. It's been a year now, and I'm now working as the breast cancer patient coordinator at Fairfax Hospital. Yes. As a survivor, I can go in and speak to women who've just had a mastectomy, and I can share my experience, and they'll look at me in a totally different way than I've ever had any patient look at me before and say, oh, I'm so grateful to have you to talk to because I know you know. I reflect back because it helps me enjoy what I have now. And I look at my diagnosis and I look at, at what's happened to us as a gift. The miracle is that we're alive and that we're here to tell our story and to tell people don't ever, ever give up hope, to be strong, that prayers are answered. When we last spoke with them, both Deborah and her daughter were doing fine. Edlin's chemotherapy will end in March 2000, and if all goes well, by 2002, both mother and daughter will be considered cured. We wish them the very best of luck. Coming up next. While caring for her dying husband, a woman receives a message of hope from a very unlikely source. I just felt completely protected and blessed. And after the experience was over, I realized all the wonderful blessings that I do have. When It's a Miracle continues. If you keep an open mind and an open heart, sometimes you can find miracles in the simplest of things. That's what happens in our next story, when an everyday commercial product helps a woman face a difficult and emotional situation. It's a small miracle that contains a big lesson for all of us. In 1975, Nancy and Lynn Bayless met and fell in love in the tropical paradise of Costa Rica. Soon, the two were married and set off sailing the globe in Lynn's boat, the Apogee eventually settling down in the scenic harbor of San Diego, California. Life on board the boat was picture perfect. And then, one afternoon while playing with his great-grandchildren, Lynn felt a sharp pain in his back. It was the first external symptom of a deadly internal disease, bone marrow cancer. As his health rapidly declined, all of Nancy's attention was focused on taking care of her husband. It was a complete reversal of roles. He did everything. He was a plumber, an electrician, everything. And I didn't know how to get down in the engine room even and, and fix everything. And I just felt overwhelmed by the fact that I didn't have him to do it. But Nancy put on a brave face and never let her husband see how desperate and frightened she was. And then, okay, one night, something happened that nice took all her fears away. It was Christmas Eve, and I had just 
brought him home from the doctor's office. And I was very tired. It was midnight. I really wasn't ready for Christmas. While Lynn rested, Nancy began cleaning for the next day. And uh, I ran out of paper towels, and I went up and pulled out a roll. And I always buy white paper towels because they go with our decor. I never buy colored ones. So when I saw the roll of paper towels had colored flowers on it, it just pushed me over the edge. And I just took it and threw it across the cabin and burst into tears. Oh, I can't do anything right. Well, after I had my pity party, I went and got the roll of paper towels. And when I picked it up, I realized it had writing on it. And there were little messages, and each one of them spoke to my heart. Friendship is a special gift. And I thought of all the friends that had come to our rescue over the past few weeks, that had helped us with Christmas, that had brought us casseroles and cookies and hugs. And uh, the next message was, love is sharing. And I knew that I could call a lot of people at any time of the day or night, and they'd be there for me because I'm very blessed to have a lot of friends. And I knew that there was probably even someone that would fix the engine because that part of the boat really overwhelmed me. No act of love, however small, is ever wasted. The simple messages like gave gentle, Nancy a renewed sense of peace and well-being. And for the first time in months, she was able to settle in for a good night's sleep. I just felt completely protected and loved, cared for, blessed. And after the experience was over, I realized all the wonderful blessings that I do have. But the next morning, she would discover how very unusual her experience had been. I reached down into the bag to get out another roll. I was expecting it to be colored with flowers all over it and messages, and it was plain white. Nancy had purchased her regular white paper towels after all, but somehow she had still managed to receive the messages she so desperately needed. How many times do you really see different kind of roles in a package to begin with? Love is caring. So that was the miracle that God created for me in his mysterious way. After her experience with the paper towels, Nancy's husband's cancer went into remission, and he lived happily for seven more years. Lynn Bayless passed away peacefully on June 22, 1998, at the age of 88. We'll be right back. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us. And a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. <laughs>